Well, good morning. Good job. Andrew's always, y'all hear how he does that? That's how you need to do that. No, seriously, uh, my name's Toby. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship. And uh, I was talking to some guys last week about our purpose and why we say we exist to multiply disciples to the glory of God. And why do I say that every week? And here's the reason I say that every week. The reason I say that every week is because I want you to be able to go, oh, I go to a church who multiplies disciples to the glory of God by pursuing Christ and sharing the good news and living connected. And so I want to encourage you this week to try to memorize that with me. And as we, as you, as you're talking to people, say, hey, what kind of church you go to? We go to a church that wants to make much of Jesus and we want to multiply disciples to the glory of God. And we do that by pursuing Christ and living connected and sharing the, the good news. Because we don't want church just to be about right here today. But I'm glad you're here today. And so uh, thank you for, for, for being here. And we want to ask the Lord to be here and to be a part of our service here this morning. If you're new to Christ Fellowship, under your seats, there's a little uh, connect card. And if you've been here for a long time, you know this procedure. If you just want to put a prayer request on that and put it in the giving bucket right here at the back tables, our pastors, we get together every week and we'll pray for you. And uh, we want to walk the road that God lets you walk together. And so if you want to just take some time during the service and fill that out and just put it back there, you can leave it in the seats and we'll grab it there as well. But let's pray and invite God's Spirit to be here and to be amongst us. Father, thank you for loving us today. Thank you for encouraging us. Thank you for uh, moving in our midst, even now. God, I know that some of our mornings have been uh, crazy and uh, maybe even crushing. But God, I pray now that as we worship you, and I know that sometimes uh, in the war, worship seems like impossible, but I pray that we would worship you today in spirit and in truth, and that your spirit would fall on this place as this band leads us. God, I pray that you would anoint them and allow them to take us to the throne room of God tonight, today, as we sing, as we uh, listen as we hear. God, as we hear your word here in just a moment, I pray for Phil. I pray that as he uh, brings your precious word, as he teaches us, I pray that that would pierce deeply into our hearts, that you would, that, uh, y- you would rattle us with your spirit and what you want to do in our lives through as we begin the book, book of Luke again. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for uh, these folks who are here today. And God, I know that if you're not here, we've, we've missed it. So God, would you be here? Would you be real? Would you consume us with you this morning? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys lead us. Well, good morning, church family. We just stand together as we sing. We'll sing, He's coming on the clouds. He's coming on the clouds. Kings of kingdoms will bow down. chain will break as broken arms declare his praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is a lion the lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our God is a lamb for the sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Amen. Sing so, open up the gates. Judah, he's pouring with power and fighting 
the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty no one can who can stop the Lord Almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty sing out church who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before him. Our God is a lamb, the lamb that was slain. Sins of the world, his blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Amen. Can you give him praise, church? Amen. God has given him a name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this morning we will echo the songs of the saints and the angels in singing, holy, holy, holy is our God. We're singing holy. Take us into the Holy of Holies And into the place where kings take off their crowns We're overwhelmed by the weight of your glory You're lifted higher as bows down we're singing holy 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 is the lord we're singing holy 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 is the lord and everything changes Nothing can stand before your majesty. So be magnified until earth looks like heaven. Sing Jesus. Jesus shines brighter until the whole world sees. We will see.
join with all of heaven sing holy is the lord the ground is shaking earth is awake with this holy roar we're singing holy 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 is the lord we're singing a moment right there where you're standing. You can sit if you'd like to, but meditate, reflect on the holiness of God. We read through this scripture and take a moment to worship right there where you're at. joining with the angels and the saints and singing praise to him. Would you sing these words with us? We join with the angels, we join with the saints. We lift up your praise and we lift up your name, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We join with the angels, we join with the we lift up praise and we lift up your name, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And declare it, church. We join with the angels, join with the saints. We lift up your praise and we lift up your name, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord. commands all the hosts of heavens? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper when darkness trembles? Only a holy God. else commands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper when darkness trembles? Only a holy God. What other beauty demands such praise? What other splendor outshines the sun? What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. So come, behold him, the Consumes like fire. What of the glory consumes like fire? 
what a power can raise the dead. What a the name remains undefeated. Only a holy God. So come, behold the could rescue me from my failing? Who else could offer his only son? Who else invites me to call him Father? Only a holy God. Watch these words, church. Only my holy God. Lift your voice and sing. Come pray with me, church. God, we love you so much. We're thankful that you are holy. You are totally unique, set apart, one of a kind. There is no one like you. Lord, help that to fall on us anew this morning. Would we see you through uh, that, those eyes, Lord, would we see you for who you are, high and lifted up. God, we love you. We praise you, and it's in your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. You can be seated. Chastain. Well, good morning, church. So I'm Pastor Chastain, one of the pastors here, and we want to do a weekly, we typically do a ministry spotlight. And so this week, we thought it would be appropriate so that this Monday, so starting tomorrow, we're starting with our, our back with our small groups. And so we want to encourage you that as you leave today and as you go out, um, it's super important, super vital to the life of the church. We want to encourage you in that. It's an opportunity to get to know others, but also uh, to do life together and get and come alongside and encourage one another. So we want to strongly encourage where you have the opportunity. And I know life is busy. It's crazy coming out of Christmas and the New Year's, and I know it's, it's a season of getting back into things. So we really want to encourage you to get back into the small group groove as well. So there's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. There's, there's um, some Connect cards back there on the back where Toby is, is standing. Um, but there's Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We want to encourage you to, to pick a night that might work for you. And I uh, want to encourage you to be there. So, um, Phil, you go ahead and come up. But uh, just, again, want to highlight that ministry. It's a big deal to the life of the church. want to encourage you in that. Good morning. I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside, and glad to open the Word of God with you this morning. And we are back home in the Gospel of Luke. I mean, it feels like coming back home again in so many ways. And um, just so you know, too, like we have a table in the back that's got some of these Luke Scripture journals, and I'd highly recommend grabbing one of these as we kind of continue another set until basically about Easter time. We're going to be back in Luke, and we'll take a break again, hit Isaiah, and then probably jump back to Luke and finish it up uh, toward the end of the year. But if you grab one of these journals, this will help you as you do Bible study, small group work, um, some reflections, being able to add some notes in there. You've got the text 
on the one side and then blank on the other side for you to do some, some Bible study. So I recommend that in the back. There's a whole table full of just free books and stuff that, that we've found helpful in our lives, in our ministry, that are back there for you. So as you're doing Bible study, as you're looking for a next book to pick up, just feel free, grab one of those in the back, um, and those are, those are on us. Uh, we, we highly recommend that. Um, so we're in Luke chapter 9, and looking at the call of Jesus on, on these disciples again. And, and as we kind of look at this passage, it's, it's helpful kind of to know where this falls in the gospel of Luke. So Luke chapter 9 is what most people think is kind of the hinge chapter of the book of Luke. Um, everything before this Jesus has been ministering in Galilee. He's kind of quiet, but he's, he's, he's saying a little bit about what his ministry is about, who he is, kind of planting some, some small seeds, or as I like to, to call them, mental time bombs that are they're kind of counting down, and eventually it'll go, you know, and people will realize, oh, that's what he was going for. And so, so he's been doing a lot of that pretty quietly behind the scenes, and then starting in chapter 10 all the way to the end, chapter 24 of the book, then it's big, and it's on the scenes, and he's making very directive calls to, to people. And so, so things shift after chapter 9. And what I'd like to say is, is that the passage that we're in is one of those weird passages that kind of gets skipped over when most people are preaching it, when you're doing a lot of devotional reading and that kind of thing. It's just like, okay, what do I do with these like two really disjointed stories? But I would say this is the hinge within the hinge. This is where that, that hinge chapter really pivots because it's the first time, verse 51, that Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to go die. I'm going to go suffer. I'm, and, and he sets his face, it says, resolutely toward Jerusalem. And so there's something that really shifts in this passage. And I think for that reason, it's, it's helpful for us to kind of zoom in and pay attention to this kind of weird passage that we're going to look at this morning and see what's going on there. Because, you know, every time you make a, a big life decision, I don't care if it's, you know, taking a, taking a new job, moving across the country, getting engaged, some, something like that, and somebody were to ask you, hey, what's up with this? Like, most of us would probably have an explanation. Mo most of us could go on for about an hour explaining all the events that led up to that major transition and that major shift in, in direction for us. And so we would, we would expect to be able to explain that, somebody to be able to give some words to that. So when Jesus is making this big shift in this new direction, Surely he's got something to say, but he doesn't really explain it as much as he tells us how we should live in light of it. And so we're going to connect the dots to that this morning. Let's read Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 51. It says, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to journey to Jerusalem. He sent messengers ahead of himself, and on the way they entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But they did not welcome him, because he determined to journey to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. As they were traveling on the road, someone said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus told him, foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me. Lord, he said, first let me go bury my father. But he told him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye at my house. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So as we look at this kind of seemingly disjointed passage, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of characters, a lot of a lot of moving parts here. Um, I want us to see three basic things that all kind of coalesce together. First, we're going to see that Jesus calls us to a greater humility. We're going to see how Jesus calls us to a greater focus. And then thirdly, we're going to see how Jesus calls us to a greater gospel. There's, there's hope in, at the end of this. Um, so we're, we're going to first look at the greater humility 
in the face of opposition. You see this in that first section, that, that first montage there. You, you look at these disciples, they're, they're passing through Samaritan territory, the, the territory of the, the people, the side of the tracks you don't go to, the different people, the people who are unlike us, and they're going through, and these people don't want anything to do with Jesus. Now, yeah, and, and we look at their reaction and say, Jesus, let's bring down fire on them. And you go, wow, okay, okay, guys, that's a, that's a touch excessive, right? And we, we, we like to say, yeah, just domesticate it a little bit here, to dial it back. But you got to put yourself in their sandals. I mean, they're coming off of verse 28. They, they have been to Mount Transfiguration. They just saw Jesus seen for who he is. Like, there, there's, there's no mystery at this point. They have, they have seen Jesus in all of his power shining out as the true Son of God. They, they've seen His majesty, His glory. They, they've seen the truth. They have seen the light, okay? And, and so they've seen that, and they're going, yes, this is it. This is the truth. This is where true power is found. And, and, and who was standing beside Him? They got Moses, the guy that brought all the plagues, you know, bringing, bringing justice and judgment and freeing the people. And then, they, then they've got Elijah. who's like, what's, what's Elijah's big thing? bringing down fire. Yeah. So, so yeah, they, they've got the two like powerhouse dudes of the Old Testament there with Jesus. And they're going, all right, those guys respected Jesus. What is Jesus going to do? Like he's going he's gonna to dial it up to 11, right? Um, so, so like, let, let's see what Jesus does. And so, they're, they're anticipating this. They're, they're expecting so, so much. But in, in the, in a sense, like they, they see so much of what Jesus is, who Jesus is, but yet they see so little of who Jesus is at the same time. That's what Jesus is going to show them in this passage. Um, they're, they're looking for a throwback to Elijah. Jesus, bring down the fire, burn him up. And Jesus says, no, you, something alien about who I am has crept into your understanding of who I am. And so, uh, seeing a few things. So, so, understanding that background that the disciples are coming from is very helpful for us. Um, and, and so then, like, what is their misunderstanding? How do they, how have they missed the message of Jesus? And, and how might we miss the message of who Jesus really is? Um, so, I, I think if, if, if you look at the, the core of it, in order to kind of get to the core of what they missed in this process, is you have to kind of say, what does is, what is Jesus bring and what is Jesus' message in distinction to all the other messages and the assumptions that maybe the disciples have bought into, maybe that we have bought into. And so, begin, beginning to parse that out and say, okay, so how, how is that different from what Jesus was trying to get across? You see, everyone else, if you look at every other cultural message, every social movement, every other religion, they're going to say, basically, if you're really committed to your cause, if you've really found the truth, then you ought to demolish the opposition. You, you've got to level the playing field. You've got to, you've got to get rid of the other arguments. You've got to smash them. You know, that's why I love on YouTube, like every, every title, you know, so-and-so demolishes the other guy, you know, and it's like in these debates and whatnot. So, like, that's, that's the thinking. We, we've got to, my goal isn't to convince them. My, my goal is to coerce them. My goal isn't to change them. My goal is to cancel them. My goal isn't to love them. It's to destroy them. That, if, if you really have the truth, if you've got all the answers, why wouldn't you approach life that way? Why wouldn't you approach those who disagree with you in that way? Smash them down. Get them, get them straightened out. But that's not the message of Jesus. So, if if you're passionate for justice, for Islam, for atheism, or even, careful, for Christianity, we have this desire, this passion to demonstrate our accuracy, our truth, by pushing back, by crushing the opponents. And as soon as we protest, well, you know, I wouldn't do that. My group of people wouldn't do that. Well, absolute power corrupts absolutely. As soon as, as, soon as there's power, this, this tendency creeps in, doesn't it? And so, so the disciples have glimpsed and tasted the power of Jesus. And so they say, okay, let's show them who's in charge. They've tasted the truth of Jesus, and they say, ah, let's show everybody how wrong they are. But they've missed 
the true taste of who Jesus really is, the, the big picture. So, so to get the, the big picture of if, if I only understand the, the truth and the power of who Jesus is, the truth and the power of the gospel, then I'm going to become very arrogant. I'm going to become just like these disciples and say, God, just bring down fire on them. Crush, crush everyone who disagrees. We, we need to win. We need to, to win the day. If, if you only, on the other hand, grasp the love and grace of the gospel without its power and without its truth, you become very impotent, become very weak, and, and you don't have anything absolute that you can hold out of truth to the world. But thirdly, if you grasp both the power and truth of the gospel and the love and the grace of the gospel, then you become able to be patient and humble. And, and, and why is that? Why is that it, the, the case? Jesus is, J, Jesus is basically saying, in, in me, you have found something that is vastly different from every other cultural message, every other religion, every other system of thinking, because every other system of thinking is going to skew in one of those two directions, either complete arrogance or this kind of impotence of, like, I, I can't really tell you where truth is, but, I, you know, I'm going to be very loving and gracious toward you, but, but I have no absolute standard of morals, of justice, of truth, right and wrong, and that, those kinds of things. And so, so Jesus being able to embody all of that within himself is an incredibly countercultural message. It's something that even today, every other religion, you, you, you are better because you have bettered yourself. You have reached up to God. You have acclaimed, claimed something on your own. You have achieved something, greatness on your own. Versus in Jesus, we haven't achieved anything on our own. If, if he's, he's saying to the, the disciples, if you really get me and if you really get what I'm trying to say to you, it's that I've reached down to you. And so, yes, you've accessed the ultimate source of power. You've accessed ultimate truth. But that truth has reached down to you in, in your condition and has reached down in love and grace. And so, because of that, we are enabled. We don't consistently do it, do we? But we're enabled to live in a way that is patient and humble with others. <laughs> The gospel gives us the resources necessary to tap in to that higher power, to ultimate truth, without resorting to jihad or council culture. It's, it's totally different. That's what Jesus is saying. My message is so different. And, and there's actually an example. I, I think if the original readers uh, of Luke were, were reading this, paying attention, thinking, they probably would be thinking of another story right now. They would be thinking back to, back in the book of Genesis, there's a story about a guy named Abraham. And Abraham has this nephew brother, this adopted brother named Lot. And Lot parts ways with him, goes off to the city called Sodom. And we probably know about Sodom as kind of like this, this evil city full of all kinds of uh, sin and injustice and cruelty and all, all sorts of stuff going on that's bad in Sodom. And God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to go crush Sodom. I'm going to bring fire down from heaven on Sodom. And, and, and Abraham does something really interesting. He doesn't say, God, just get my brother out. Get, get my adopted brother out of Sodom, get his family out, and, and let the city burn. He, he doesn't pull a disciples. He doesn't pull a James and John. What he does is he says, oh, God, would, would you impute the righteousness? Would you, would you substitute the righteousness of 50 people in the place of all of that wickedness? Would you look at the righteousness of them and, and accept that to stand in the place of all the unrighteousness of the city? And God says, sure. And Abraham says, well, okay, God, you're, you're a just God. You're a good God. And so would you take 45? <laughs> and he works him all the way down to 10. He says, okay, for, the, for 10 righteous people, would you let them substitute for all the unrighteousness of this? He, he cares about the city. He's passionate for, for the souls of the city. And he says, don't bring down fire. Substitute the righteous ones in the place of the unrighteous ones. And so he's begging and pleading on behalf of this sinful city. What a, what a contrast to the disciples the disciples are all about bringing down the fire, and Abraham is pleading that God would not stop the fire, hold it back on, on the part of the righteous ones. 
The disciples are only wonderstruck with the power of Jesus. They, they haven't really got, they, they didn't get what Abraham got. And Abraham, if, I was talking with Toby this week, like Abraham, and you look at his story, like this, this guy's messed up. He's, he's sinning all the time. Like he puts his wife in harm's way to save his own skin. Like who is this guy? And this is the, like, this is the hero of the faith kind of guy. Like Genesis doesn't portray him that way. Genesis portrays him as this messed up, super flawed dude that, that messes up just about every turn he makes. But God still blesses him. God is still gracious to him. God is still good to him. And God comes through in a, in a miraculously powerful way. And, and because of that, Abraham is able to look and say, you know what, I know that God is powerful. I know that God is true, but you know what? I know that God is gracious, and I know that God is loving. And because of that, I can plead on behalf of a city. I can be very humble and patient and, and, and plead that God would do the same for these people who've rejected him. I can do that because I've, I've been able to see all of the big picture of who God is. Have you seen the big picture of who God is? Do you have a big Jesus, a big gospel, or a tiny gospel? Or are you seeing one part of the picture? Uh, so, I, as, as I try to say, okay, well, how, how, do, how do we unpack this? How, how is this a challenge for me? Am I pressed in the same way that these disciples are? And, and what the question I would put as a, kind of a self-evaluation, a self-test, am, am I, do I have a tiny gospel? Do I have a tiny Jesus? I would ask myself, how, how do I respond when my beliefs are challenged, when people push back, um, when non-Christians reject the message of the gospel? Do, or do I feel angry when the, when the Satanists put up their nativity display during Christmas? Do I feel enraged when I'm greeted with a happy holidays and fire back up. Well, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, um, do, is is the, the never-ending push to get Christians to, to fail, not exercise their Christianity in the public square, does, does that make you angry and want to fight back and push back? How does, how does that make you respond when your beliefs are not accepted, when your beliefs are rejected, when you're pushed out of the city, when hospitality is not reciprocated. The, the message, I, and, and, and as a result, you'll, you'll see that message shift between, uh, a, lot, a lot of times, uh, even, you know, as I look at a lot of preaching, a lot of, uh, even, even where Christians go with, with their messaging today, it's very easy to get caught up on every, every social issue. We've got to push back. We've got to fight back. Then, then you have some that they're really amped up on apologetics. How can we defend our faith? We, how can we, we defend our beliefs? And, and there's, there's value in that. We need to be able to communicate the gospel to the social issues of the day. We need to be able to understand objections to the Christian faith and explain that. But when our posture is so absorbed by those things, sometimes it, it hints that maybe we've missed the big picture of what the gospel's all about. The message of Christianity isn't angry hostility. It's humble patience. And Jesus, Jesus tells the disciples, it says in real strong language, he rebuked them. <laughs> he says, shut up, guys. Oh, sorry, kids. Shush. Shush. Shut, shut your mouths. <laughs> None of that talking here. Um, I said, be quiet. He could have shut up the Samaritans, right? But he, he shushes his disciples instead. Yeah, that's shocking. So, so we see a, a greater humility, but we also see a greater focus that he expects from his disciples that he calls his disciples to. Um, I, I love, we, we get introduced to the guys that could have been the 13th, 14th, and 15th disciples, right? Uh, and, and so he gives us these three characters, and, and I'll give you some, some tags for them to, to kind of help lodge them in your mind. You get first the, the prima donna, uh, is, is how I, I like to think of him. So this guy, he shows up, verse 57, I don't, I don't know, I'm like, you can imagine like the 12 disciples are having lunch on a hill somewhere, and uh, all of a sudden this, this 13th dude is like hang, hanging out there on the fringe, hey, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. I'm like, where did he come from? Like, how did he slip in here? Okay, well, um, and, and so Jesus it pushes back on this guy. This guy, he wants to be a disciple, but 
But he's got an eye for more. He's, he's got this, this idea that, you know, if Jesus is really the Messiah, that he's going to come and conquer and win, and, and I'm going to, I don't know, get a crown or a throne, or, you know, maybe, maybe I get to rule part of Galilee or something like that. I don't, I don't know. So, so he's got these ambitions of all these lofty things, and Jesus says, you know what? If you're going to follow me, you won't even have a place to sleep. Don't forget about a palace. Forget about all the, the great stuff in life that you think you're going to get from following me. You, you, you probably won't even have a place to sleep at night. And the, and the passage doesn't say what his reaction is, but, but probably not great. The second character that we meet is the passive guy. Um, this, this is the... This is the unambitious disciple that's kind of, he's always been following the pack. He's always kind of been around, hanging out on the, on the periphery. He's, he's been the guy on the sidelines. And Jesus looks at him and says, uh, there, <laughs> I love it. He, just, he just points out and says, follow me. We, we've seen this language before in the, in the Gospel of Luke, verse 59, follow me, follow me. And, and, the, and he's basically saying, get off the bench, become part of the team, come join us, come do this mission with us. And the guy, and Jesus knows that this objection is going to come. The guy says, you know what? I'm dealing with a lot of family stuff right now. Dad's just passed away. I've got to get back home. I've got to deal with the, the affairs of, of the estate. I've, I've got to take care of obligations right now. This, this is too much. I can't, I can't really all the way commit. I can, I can still hang around on the fringes, but I can't really commit to this. And Jesus is saying, commit, commit. And, and, and in fact, Jesus pushes back and says, you know what, let, let the dead bury the dead. What, what does that mean? Jesus almost does these like cryptic statements. Sometimes. Well, the, the implication is he's saying, let, let the people who are spiritually dead, that have no desire to, to follow after God, the Holy Spirit isn't doing a work in their lives, let them take care of those affairs. But you, you particular dude, you need to come and follow me. You need to do something only spiritually alive people can do, and that is spread the message of the kingdom. Come do that. Come invest your life in something greater. He's calling him out on something. The third one is the preoccupied one. Uh, this, this guy wants to follow Jesus. Again, these, another one of these wannabes. Um, but Jesus knows and, and pushes back to the guy who says, I want to follow you. He says, well, you, you know you got to keep your hand on the plow. You can't. What, what does that mean? Uh, it, it means when, when it comes, yeah, following Jesus, there is no Tesla autopilot. You know, you, know, you, you have to keep your hands on the wheel. Uh, the, those, those of you who just got new cars, you know, you, you, you got you to gotta keep the eye on the road, right? Am I right? Um, so, so uh, you know, stay in, stay in focus, stay in your lane. You got you to you gotta pay attention. And so, as we look at those three dudes and we look at their uh, issues, I, I would say, it would be a misunderstanding if we said, Jesus wants all of us to never attend a funeral ever again, right? That, that, that misses the point, right? Uh, what, what Jesus is doing is very much like what he does with the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler is this guy who says, I want to follow you. I want eternal life. And Jesus goes through all these commands, and then he says, okay, give all that you have to the poor. And the guy goes, oops. <laughs> <laughs> That's not for me. Uh, because Jesus knows his heart. He knows the one thing that really holds this guy back from following him. He knows what that is. And for each of these three dudes, he knows what the one thing is that they're holding tight. The one thing that's going to cause a problem. for. And, and you see it actually come out in verse 59, verse 61 uh, in their response. Like the, almost the very first word they say is, yeah, but first... Jesus, but first, let me go bury my father. But first, let me go say goodbye to my family. I mean, some of these things are major. Some of these things are minor. But they all have something that comes first before following Jesus. They can't just set aside the nets and follow Jesus. Say, ah, I've got to take care of something first before I can follow you. I mean, this, this is almost offensive that Jesus would expect so much of his disciples, isn't it? It's, it almost seems like, wow, that's, that's a bit much. But, but here, if, 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 we, if we think about it, put it in, in our terms, I, like there, there are so many times that our but what abouts betray our tiny Jesus. All, the, the thing that I have to say, yeah, but first, let me, let me figure this out. I, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who I'm talking about the Christian message 
And, and they say, well, yeah, but I, I, there's a lot about Jesus that's really compelling. I, I found, find really fascinating as I you know, read through the Gospel of John or whatnot. I remember a conversation I had with a young man. He said, yeah, but, but I really need to understand the Christian message about sexuality. Like, if, if, if it's okay, or if I need to move out of the apartment with my girlfriend, or others who are saying, you know, I, I really need to understand whether whether I can or can't act on my same-sex attraction. I, I need to know about this first before I can make a decision about Jesus. And, and the challenge is, is, is not those objections. And, and I think a lot of times Christians spend a lot of time, a lot of energy trying to answer those things, explain those things, explain what the Bible says, and, and defend what the Bible says. And we spend a lot of energy doing that. But the problem is, is not the objection. The problem is they haven't they haven't caught hold of who Jesus is. The, the Jesus they're saying is too tiny, is too small. If you really understood who Jesus is, if you understood who it was that's saying, follow me, no other firsts, then it would make sense. It would be compelling. I, I could lay aside those objections. The other observation I would make is our biggest problem we, we often think, my biggest problem in the new year, following Jesus, setting things aside, really making a commitment to Jesus, is, you know, I'm just, I'm just lazy. I, I have a hard time staying on track. Jesus puts his finger on it with, with the second guy. He says, let the dead bury their dead. He says, the, the issue is not your laziness, your failure to commit to my cause. The issue is spiritual deadness. Spiritually dead people don't follow me. Spiritually dead people don't follow Jesus. Only spiritually alive people can follow Jesus. Only spiritually pe uh, alive people who God has, has awakened them and shown them who I am. That's who follows me. That's who makes the commitment. And, and conversely, those of us who, who are trying to make big commitments, take next steps this year and say, I, I'm going to commit to read my Bible through or, or stick with this devotional plan or commit to a small group or whatever it is that's kind of your next big thing. Your, your issue is not going to be a battle with laziness. The, the battle is going to be all those dead leaves on the tree of your life that the Holy Spirit's got to shake off in your life. That's what your battle is this year. It's not your laziness. It's spiritual deadness that wants to still cling on to you. The, the third observation I would make is that our, our biggest priorities, Jesus puts his finger on these three priorities, uh, the, really largely based on material possessions and family, and he puts his finger on those things and says, if you can't let that go, you'll never be able to follow me. You'll never really be able to put your eyes on me and run after me. And, and, and in doing so, he, he puts... That whatever that but what about is for you, whatever that is that kind of holds you back and says, well, you know, I've got to keep my Christianity private to myself. This is, this is really just a me thing. Um, I can't really take that bold next step that I know God wants me to do, but, it, but man, that's risky. Man, that really steps out. It might step on my toes, other people's toes. It's just a lot. Um, whatever that but what about is for you exposes something about your deepest priorities, your deepest identity, and in fact, the Bible would say, about our deepest idols, the things that we treasure in our heart instead of God. Uh, I think about it this way. When I, when I uh, spend time in premarital counseling, uh, sometimes I'll get the question, uh, or even talking to, to married guys or whatnot that haven't had kids yet, they'll, they'll ask the question, when, when should we have kids? When, when should we make that a priority in life? And, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, I've got this, I've got school, I've got debt, I've got this job, I've got, I've got this, I've got that, I've got all these things, and maybe, you know, is it, is it five years from now? Is it, you know, when, when should that be? And, and I, I'll pass along some, some advice that was helpful to me. There's never the right time to have kids. It just, it just never is. I, every, every time we've had kids, it's always been like, wow, this, this was not the ideal. This was not, uh, you know, all, all of life wasn't all tidy and neat and perfect. But you know what? It'll work out. God will give the, the strength. It'll, it'll be fine. It, it'll happen. And, and, and in a similar way, is there ever a good time to follow Jesus? Is there ever a time in your life where, where you've got everything together, where, you know, the, the 
family is in the right place, job, net worth is, is just right, and, and then I can follow Jesus. Then I can make the big commitment. Then I can go do something for God. Uh, no, it'll never happen. If you're waiting for that, it'll never, ever come. So the things that make you say, I'm, I'm not ready to make, make that next step with Jesus in, in this new year, to go make a commitment to follow God in some way, those things expose our deepest, deepest idols. So wrapping this up, where, where do we come? Full circle. Um, if, if you look back at the beginning, verse 51, Jesus resolutely sets his face to go to Jerusalem. His time has come. He's going to the cross. He's going to find his gravestone. He's, he's committed to go to the end. And, and what is that backdrop? You have to read these calls to these, these very audacious calls to set aside their superiority, to set aside their rightness, to set aside all their priorities and follow Jesus. Who, who is he to make that kind of call on our lives? Here's who he is. He's the one that will go right to the cross and knows where he's going. He's committed to going on the plan and mission of God for his life. He is not calling you to step out and do something for him that he has not done for us. He is committed to go to the cross. He is committed to his mission. And, I, you know, who, who, who wouldn't want to follow someone like this. I, I think of in the, the Band of Brothers, there's <clears throat> Major, Major Winters has that, that moment at the beginning of, you know, is, is he going to, uh, you know, take a, if, you know, go skip his pass to go off base, or is he going to get court-martialed? And he, he said, I would rather be court-martialed uh, for doing what's right by my guys. You know, he, he's willing to, to take the ultimate sacrifice to, to have identity with his guys, to, to, to lead his guys out well. And, and for that reason, his guys follow him with courage throughout the entire time. You know, he, he just demonstrates this incredible leadership. And, and it's in a, in a very similar way. Jesus leads out. He's not asking for more than what he's, he's committed to himself. Um, but at the same time, I, I look at this passage, and I have two wake-up calls. I go, I, I don't have humility in the face of opposition like this. Like so many times, there's so much in me that just bows up under pressure. When the culture around us pushes in, I, I want to fight back. I want to push back. I want to I see fire come down. You know, there, there's that part of me. And so humility in the face of opposition, that's, that's really hard. That's a, that's a tough ask. The second thing is, is that focus in the face of distractions, you know, I'm, I'm like that, you know, squirrel, squirrel, you know. Uh, and, and so to stay focused on the cause of Jesus and his mission in my life, it's so difficult, so hard. But, but I, I would encourage us, look to Jesus. If, if the backdrop of these calls on our lives is Jesus, then we can, in the face of opposition, in the face of that, as, as we're struggling with humility, we can remember Jesus is the one that took down the fire from heaven, not just 50 righteous people, not just 10 righteous people, one righteous person absorbed the fire of the wrath of God in himself on the cross for us. If, if he could take that for us, what, what about these petty insults? What about, what about these, these things that push back on us as Christians? Surely, in light of that, I can, I can step forward and do what, see, Jesus in, in his path to Jerusalem, his resolute face-like stone to go in this direction of, of death, he goes right into a place of opposition, right into a place of discomfort, right into a place where he knows he's going to be rejected by the Samaritans in a little tiny way, and then rejected in Jerusalem in a big, huge way, and he runs right into that. I mean, his call on our lives to face opposition, rejection, in a small way, surely that, that is no greater than our master. That is no greater than Jesus. Jesus was merciful in places where we resort to vindictiveness. He succeeded where you and I fail. In, in the face of life's distractions, in face of the, the desire, the comfort for home and family, on, on his earthly life, Jesus walks away from his father, his mother, his brothers. He, he walks away from that as rejected by them. He's even ultimately rejected by, by God the Father on the cross. I, I can't explain that, but that's what happens. God, God's face is turned away from His Son. Ultimate rejection, ultimate thing, that priority that could have compelled Him. In fact, He says, you know, not my will, 
but yours be done. He lays down his wills, his wants, for the sake of the mission of God. And as, as we face those things that would pull us away, as we look at Jesus who, who laid down his will for the sake of the Father, it's, it's incredible. In fact, it's something that we can't really live up to. In fact, this week, I guarantee you I'm going to fail in probably both of those areas because, because I am a sinner who is in need of a Savior. I'm not here in a way that I can help myself to get there. Jesus has to do that in me. I'm, I'm looking at one who stands in my place before God as the one who has perfectly succeeded in both of these areas. And because of that, I have the power. I have, I have His transforming power at work in my life to make me more and more and more like Jesus, more and more and more able to go deeper into the mission of God, deeper into the path of discipleship, the journey of discipleship that He has for me. And I, you know, as we close, I'll just say one thing that kind of hit me as I was meditating before the service and um, like just, just really brings this home because for, for some of us, like you, you may find yourself like me just at certain weeks, like distractions are crazy. Like this morning was this crazy distracting for me. Kid issues, family issues, just a lot of stress, a lot of things going on, a lot of plate spinning. Um, and, and you look at these calls to, to discipleship and you're just like, I am, I'm nowhere near that. You know what's, what's encouraging to me is, is that, that one guy in the middle, the passive guy who's, who's around the fringes, God, Jesus knows that he's got all this other stuff on his mind. Jesus knows that he is crazy burdened down with the, the passing of his dad. He, he knows all of that baggage. And what does Jesus still do? Jesus still points at him and says, follow me. That's, that's actually the mercy of Jesus, who knows how messed up we are, how much other stuff we've got in our lives, and still says, follow me, follow me. And that's, that's encouraging to me this week. Is it encouraging to you? I, I hope so, to, to follow after him. If there's something that's holding you back this week, would you talk, grab one of the pastors, grab one of the small group leaders and <clears throat> talk with us. I, I would love to have that conversation about what's holding you back from following me. What's, what's holding you back from taking that step with Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you do not ask more of us than what you did yourself, that you, in fact, give the power for us to follow in your steps. Because of the gospel, we are empowered to take those steps of deeper discipleship. Because of the gospel and because of um, all that you've done for us in you, I, I pray that you would be with us as we pursue that journey of discipleship this week. And pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil. You know, Phil and I don't spend a lot of time, if any time, really coordinating what we sing with what's being taught. But the Spirit often works and has again this week in, in giving us a prayer that we can sing as we close this service. That just fits so well with what was shared, with what was communicated. You know, when you, when you see Jesus for who he is, when you see what he's done for what it is, when we have a big God and a big gospel, which we do, the response is, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. This whole song's a prayer. I'd encourage you to pray through it as we sing, as we close this service. Would you stand together as we sing, Lord, I need you.
Pastor Toby. That is so, so, so true. Um, as we close out uh, today, thank you for being here. And uh, a couple of you have asked about, uh, you know, you say, hey, who's, where do the small groups meet at? I want to introduce where we meet at, if that's okay. All right. So I know like Monday night groups, I lead that group at the Whaley's house. Wave at us, Stephen Olga Whaley, right there. And, and, and Andrew, <laughs> don't forget Andrew. Is back there in the back. Tuesday nights, Phil leads it at his house over in Taylor's. And then on Wednesday night, Brent and Josh lead it at the Almond's house. Okay? So when somebody, when one of the pastors, oh, we're small enough now, you probably know who all the pastors are, who all the small group leaders are. But when somebody says that, if you're new, you don't, I don't know who the small group leaders are. And that goes for anything, like after the service, if somebody needs prayer or you want to talk about something or whatever, you just find one of us because we're hanging out and we're, we're doing the thing before anybody leaves. So we just want you to know that and get used to that, that type of thing. Also, I've been asked, to, or somebody asked me this week, hey, how can I give? So I'm a, I'm a Gen X guy. I like giving by a check and stuff. And so I don't do the online. I do do the online stuff. It was really hard for me to get the use, used to that. But you can go to our website, you can pay online, there's a way to show, you can give your tithes online, or there's a way to show you how to text, there's a lot of weird stuff going on, or if you're like me, you can drop something in that bucket right there in the back, and you can be able to uh, give to the mission of the church and what, what we're doing with that, okay? So um, don't forget, small groups do start back this week. Also, there's a Multiplying Disciples Summit that's coming up on uh, and at the end of the month at the Cherrydale place and you're free to sign up for that it'd be a lot of fun thank you for being here i know there's somebody here that you do not know right because i know there's brand new people that's never been until, until today i want to encourage you to find somebody you don't know maybe you've seen them for the last three or four weeks that you don't know hang out with them meet them find out where they like to eat and go eat together or something okay all right you are dismissed thank you for being here